Welcome, everybody, to uh, after a short hiatus to another uh, QSS navigation webinar. Um, I hope you had a good uh, Memorial Day uh, weekend. Um, it's getting warm out there now, so uh, there's no excuse anymore to go up into the high country. Um, and um, what I wanted to briefly announce is that uh, you probably all know that, but uh, CMC is open again for scheduling hikes. Uh, just make sure you adhere to the regulations that we put forth um, that are on the website. I think it's like a limit of eight people that um, can be in a group in a hike that includes the leader. And I think it's, uh, we're discouraging C hikes. So uh, A and B hikes is fine. So sign, go, go online. If you're a leader, put, on, uh, put up a trip uh, or join one that you want to, but you have to be quick because if there's only eight people to sign up, there will be a lot of wait lists. Um, I wanna thank, as always, uh, Maddie Miller and uh, Robbie Monsma for helping me organize this um, seminar series or webinar series. My name is Mike Tischer, for those of you guys who are joining here for the first time. And Mike is doing... What's it, Robbie? I, I just said, Mike's doing all the work. I'm not. <laughs> it's a <laughs> lot of can, fun. And our guests, but can I add something? I, Maddie, oh, yes, I don't know please. if on the website we, but there's a checklist for everybody, like trip leaders and people on the roster. There's also a trip leader guide, which is long, but it really doesn't add much other than directly what you would expect, you know, checking temperatures and things like that by asking. Yeah, make sure to check that out before you either join the trip or um, put one uh, online. But I think we're all glad that we can do this again now that it's June. Hopefully those will get better. Um, I think the regulations are are good for like this month and then you know it's on a month to month basis depending on what happens with COVID. So hopefully we're getting better through the summer, but uh, I'm just really excited that we can do this again. In preparation for the hikes that you're gonna do from now on, um, we'll have a couple of uh, webinars coming up actually. One will be next week, Public Lands history as well as regulations. Very, very important if you're planning a trip and you wanna know what you can or can't do in wilderness areas, for instance, or um, public lands uh, in general. And that's done by Gary Lacane. He's gonna come in next Monday and do that. And then we have Barbara Auden uh, give us a little intro to how to use your Garmin. Um, that was a big request by a lot of folks. So I already saw the draft of that uh, presentation and it looks absolutely great. So make sure if you have a Garmin and you wanna learn a couple secrets or you're new to the Garmin uh, universe, make sure to join. That will be in two weeks and uh, that's an intro. The plan is to do a follow-up session a few weeks after that. Um, the idea is to just get everybody uh, going with their Garmin device and then you, you, know, you can play around for a couple of weeks and then have a sort of an, a, an advanced session following that um, two or three weeks after that first intro session. So if you're interested in that, make sure to sign up. The, both of those, the public lands as well as the Garmin one, are uh, uh, online now and you can sign up for them. Um, that said, I wanted to welcome back Robert Leclerc, who uh, some of you might remember from the Cotrax webinar. It was our first webinar. He was a guinea pig. <laughs> he, he came in and did a marvelous job. And he's going to talk about something that I'm sure everybody knows, which is Google Earth. But then also something that a lot of folks probably don't know, and that's the ArcGIS Earth. It's kind of a successor to Google Earth, but I'm sure he will explain how they are connected and what they can do. Um, Robert, of course, is working with Esri. So he's working with a company who is uh, responsible for the development of ArcGIS. And so he knows a thing or two about those software packages. So. I'm sure it's going to be great and there's going to be a lot of insight. So with that said, I'll hand it over to Robert uh, for the webinar. All right. Thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. So uh, good evening, folks. As uh, Mike said, my name is Robert O'Claire and uh, Mike's right. I do work for a company called Esri. Uh, it's a GIS software company. It's an international company. And uh, we our tagline is that the world's leader in GIS technology. So I will talk about ArcGIS Earth in a little bit. In fact, what I'm going to do right now is 
turn off my videos so I'm preserving the bandwidth so my presentation comes through uh, clear for everyone here. So I'm a senior instructor for Esri. This is what I do professionally. I teach classes on uh, mapping and technology. So I'm fairly familiar with uh, Google Earth. I've used it recreationally over the years since it's been out. And then also I do want to talk about another application called ArcGIS Earth and kind of orient this around uh, trip planning and how this all works for folks. So a couple of points of uh, order. If you have an open mic, uh, go ahead and make sure that your mic is muted. Uh, you can certainly have a video on if you want to. It's not distracting to me. It just means that maybe you might have some choppy issues on your side when I'm sharing things. So if you want to turn off your video, you may. If you want to keep it on, that's perfectly fine too. And then if you have questions about anything, let's try to save those questions to the end. But if you want to type them into the chat pod while you're thinking about them, that's perfectly fine. And then I'll go ahead and address those questions at the end of the presentation. So let's kind of get into this concept here and start talking about uh, our presentation tonight. What I want to cover with everyone is cover the first thing that you're probably familiar with, which is Google Earth. I'm going to talk briefly about its history and its deployment options. And so the whole genre of Google Earth has changed dramatically over the last 10 to 15 years. And I'll kind of show you how I use this for trip planning and I'm going to show you different options. One's called the web version of our uh, Google Earth. Another one's called the desktop application of Google Earth. And this is more of the traditional software one installs on a PC. The next thing I'm going to do after that is certainly go in and demo those applications so you can see what I've created for trip planning and then also prior trips. It's kind of a fun way to share what you've done with your trips out in the Colorado the backcountry. From there, I'm going to go into something called ArcGIS Earth, talk about what this application is. As Mike said, it's kind of the successor to some degree of Google Earth, but I'll explain what that means with its history and deployment options here as well. And then I'm going to show you the desktop uh, installation of ArcGIS Earth and then uh, the mobile device, so the mobile application of ArcGIS Earth. And that's going to be a demo I'm going to run. Uh, Fingers crossed, everything works this time with my phone. We tested it out before everyone showed up today and it seemed to work just fine. So we'll see how this all plays out. All right, so let's talk about what you know. Uh, Google Earth. Google Earth is an interesting application. And it's been around for quite some time. In fact, if you look at the history here, it says it came out in July of 2001. This is the, uh, the early days of the internet when we really didn't have inc incredible bandwidth that we have now, but it was a really interesting application. Uh, it was originally called the Keyhole Earth Viewer, which is kind of a mouthful, certainly. And this wasn't even on Google's radar to purchase. So this was initially developed to assist with video games, if you can believe that. And so they brought in a lot of real world imagery overlaid it on top of topography. And they got some really nice views of three dimensional terrain for video games. And they said, well, you know, we've got something here. This is pretty interesting. Over a course of about three years or so, they started kind of making their name known about what they were doing with mapping and technology. And that caught the eye of Google. So Google said, you know what, we really like what you guys are doing. We want to incorporate your technology into ours. And to me, I kind of laugh when I hear this because it sounds like Star Trek The Borg, if you're ever familiar with that TV series here. So in 2004, uh, that's when Google acquired Keyhole. And so if you think about the files that Google uses, it uses KMLs, KMZs. And if you're really curious about what those mean, it means keyhole markup language, all right? That's keyhole, they originated the language. And then keyhole markup zip, KMZs. And so we kind of use KML, KMZs interchangeably here, but it does honor back to the original company, which was keyhole. Now, over the course of many years, Google did some pretty interesting advancements with Google Earth. They incorporated, whoops, excuse me, they incorporated, okay, went backwards, 3D imagery. Uh, so now we can see photorealistic buildings in urbanized areas. And so I'll show you that, what that looks like. Uh, we have something called Street View. And Street View is very interesting because what you can do is move a little person onto a street, switch it over to Street View, and then it shows you as if you're standing on the street, what your environments look like. They also started working with subsurface. So they started looking at water and the ocean. 
And so one of the things that's interesting is that under oceans, there's a whole landscape down there as well. There's mountainous terrains, uh, there's deep oceanic trenches and so on. And so these things are all mapped as well for a variety of purposes. A lot of it has to do with shipping of goods and services and a lot of it's for the military. Uh, and then over time, they said, well, let's do more than just the earth, let's do the sky. So Google Sky came around and then they started working with Google Mars and Google Moon. And these are all available with the desktop application that you can install for free. And then they also brought in some fun things of flight simulators. I really haven't played with the flight simulators too much, but you can pilot an F-16 if you want to. And I'll show you how that works as well. Now let's talk about uh, ever since July 2017, what happened? Well, Google got out of the Google Earth business. All right, and what that basically means, I was telling Mike this a little bit, is Google tried to get into what's called GIS, which means Geographic Information Systems, basically mapping. If you've ever used a web map, that's kind of what I do. We work with web technologies and desktop software to map everything, whether it's trails, mountaintops, streets, buildings, things like that. Well, my company that I work for, Esri, is what we call the world's leader in GIS technologies. We've been doing GIS for 50 years. Google tried to get into the market and decided early on that wasn't best for them to do that. And so they migrated all of their enterprise customers to us and then effectively gave away the store. What does that mean? Well, they made Google Earth Pro free. And so this used to cost money. If you wanted to work with Google Earth Pro, this required licensing for key codes and things like that. They just said, nope, not anymore. It's free. Have fun with it. Okay, what does that mean to you? Well, it means that they're not constantly updating and evolving the software. It's stuck in 2017. Then Google uh, Earth disappeared from the landscape for a while. And then fast forward about a year ago and Google Earth on the web reappeared. And so this is a new iteration of Google Earth, but web-based. And so you can see I've got this URL here. It's just www.google.com backslash earth. And if you go there, that opens up Google Earth and you'll see that. I've already mentioned that Google Earth Pro is free. I'll show you how to go and get that as well. There's just basically a, a download here for this. And then you can see that we have Google Earth on mobile devices, which means it can work with your iPhone or your Android. You just go to those respective stores and search for Google Earth and you can work with it. So instead of talking about Google Earth, let me get into this and show you all these different variations of how this all works. All right, so let me minimize my PowerPoint here and let me go into a web page here uh, and talk first about Google Earth on the web. This is it, okay? In fact, I'm gonna copy and paste this in the chat for everyone. So if you wanna just bookmark this for a later time, you may. And so you can see here, it talks about what it is. It has an overview and it kind of changes our appearance of uh, different parts of the world here. And then we have something at the top here called Earth versions. And this is what I was referencing before. There are many ways in which we can go and distribute Google Earth. So if I come over here, here they are. They talk about this Google Earth on the web, Google Earth on mobile, like your mobile devices or Google Earth on the desktop. And so in this case, what I wanna start with right now is launching Earth, but I wanna go and work with the web version. So I'll do that, and here's what's gonna happen. It's gonna go and basically load the world on my PC. And so you're gonna see a little status bar here. Uh, hopefully it loads up rather quick. And then what it's gonna do here for me in just a moment is basically start up with a splash screen that basically says, what can we do with Google Earth? And so hopefully this will go a little bit faster. We'll see what happens here. Uh, there we go. Now it's starting to make some progress. But in the meantime, we have a nice little atmosphere. Oh, there we go. And so now it starts up and this is the new version of Google Earth. So it's as if you're in orbit around the planet. And if you're a longtime veteran or user of the desktop application, you're gonna notice it's very different. It doesn't have as much and that's by design. So what they've done is they've optimized a lot of things here. So let me kind of orient you to the interface. On the bottom left here, we can do what's called a place mark. You can add a point. Uh, here, we can draw a line or a shape. 
Over on the right are our navigation tools. So if you want to do a zoom in or zoom out, you can click that plus or minus. If you want to orient to the north, you just click on this compass right here. If you want to go into 3D, you just click on 3D. We have street view right here. And then lastly, we have fly to your location. So what I'm going to do is fly to my location right now. It wants to know my location, so I'll say allow. And you're going to see kind of Google Earth that would do its thing. And it's going to zoom in to where I'm calling you, which is Lafayette, Colorado. So I'm up in the northwest burbs. And in fact, you can see that uh, the town home I'm calling in, which is roughly right about here. So this is where I'm currently calling you from right now. Now, let's uh, also orient you a little bit with regards to the interface on the left. Over here on these three lines, this is the menu, and you can sign into this. I've already signed in because I want to show you a project here. But what's interesting about this part here is we have something called Voyager, which I'll demonstrate in a few minutes. You can create what I call Google Earth projects. And so I created one for a climb I did a week and a half ago. I'll show you that with a project. If we go into map style, map style has the ability here to kind of show you either a lot or not so much, or they call it clean. So when we talk about clean, that means no borders or labels or places. So you don't see the boundary of countries or states. If you say exploration, then you do see those uh, political jurisdiction boundaries. You will see places and roads. And then if you have everything, literally it's everything that they have. So landmarks, waters, labels, and so on here. So I'll zoom out. And you can see I've got exploration, so we have various parks here, but not a lot. And then as I come down in here, I have this ability to turn on 3D buildings, which they are currently on. So if I want to see a 3D building, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and uh, kind of go a little, okay, come on. We'll go out till 3D. There we go. And so there's 3D. And so I've got those buildings, and you can see the 3D buildings here. Now, it's much more impressive when I go into downtown Denver, for sure. But the way I got here was click on 2D or 3D, and I went right to 3D. So I think it's pretty interesting. You've got trees, you've got cars. It's truly a 3D environment. Now, if I zoom out to the world, we have animated clouds. And then if you want to work with latitude, longitude lines down here, you may. So these are all the options. Not a lot with the map style, but kind of curious. I'll zoom it back. Now we have uh, also the ability to do measures here, but let's talk about the other two. If you want to explore the world, we have something called Voyager. And so here they talk about editor's picks, and I can go and look at different categories, great hikes around the world, why not? So if you want to go do some virtual touring during the pandemic, uh, we can do that right now, and it talks about the great hikes around the world and it'll come and take us back out to the world. And so in this case, it's gonna go and say, where do you wanna go? Well, I wanna go to the Scottish Highlands. And so now it takes me to the Scottish Highlands here. And we have a very interesting view of this, basically touring with Voyager. There's a lot of content in Voyager. I can stop this revolving. I can zoom in, try to see people here, look at those trails. So if you're doing route planning, you know, maybe not necessarily do Voyager, but you could go to some of the big peaks or some of the small peaks in Colorado and try to go look at those trails and see what they are. So route planning this way is kind of interesting. But Voyager, like I said, many different categories here. It breaks it down by games and layers and nature and so on. So during our current times here, um, it's kind of a fun way to kind of educate yourself about different things around the world. Now, some other things here has to do with what's called I'm feeling lucky, which basically is a randomizer. You just click on it, it's going to take you to somewhere in the world you probably never heard of before. In this case, SAR, it's a river in Spain, and you can learn about this river in Spain. So this is a random geography thing if uh, you, that's your, your interest there. Now, I did mention uh, it does do some interesting things such as a project. And for this presentation, I did create a project. In fact, uh, I created one for a climb that uh, my girlfriend and I did to the Rio Grande Pyramid down the San Juans. And so basically, there's a tutorial here about how to create these projects. It's very easy. Uh, you just basically do searches of where things are and you can put in photos. So I'm gonna say open up a project that I created for Rio Grande Pyramid and I'll select it here. And let's go take a look about this project. For folks not familiar, Rio Grande Pyramid is a uh, centennial peak. 
13,821 feet above sea level. Uh, it's one of the highest 100 peaks in the state, and I'm kind of working this as one of my weekend projects here. So this is what we did uh, two weekends ago. We went over to this area because it was relatively snow free. Now, what I did to create this is I started finding areas. So basically I was searching for the 30 mile campground trailhead. So I basically did a search and type it in and it would take me down to that location. And then I would say, go ahead and put in a point, which it did as this uh, nice little yellow point uh, pin here. And then I went and created a picture. Now I'm in the edit mode here, which means I can go and rename these things. I can click on edit the feature. So for example, if I say I do want to edit this feature, you get basically this point here of how you want to edit it. Uh, you can put in linkages to web pages. You can put in pictures. Uh, you can change the size and the color of your place marks and so on here. And that's effectively what I did uh, for this particular project. So you can see all the different ones I have listed here, but what I'm gonna do is click on present. And when I'm talking about present, this is what you can share with friends or family. So basically it starts off here at the 30 mile campground. Uh, I have a link here that I embedded, which is basically from a webpage called climb13ers.com. It opens up the webpage and you can get directions to the trailhead based upon our virtual tour. So I can see this here, it's nice. I can come in, I can look at the terrain here. I can just change things around. I can zoom in. I can be interactive with the map. And so you can see this is the valley that we were working with. And so down at the bottom is my table of contents. I'm gonna go and click on my next part. So now I'll say, let's go to the next one here. It changes our view around. And this is where I inserted a digital picture that I took of the boundary. And then I got some uh, verbiage from the USDA, talks about the uh, Wemanuchi Wilderness Area. Again, you can interact with this, uh, see what it looks like. And in fact, you can see the trail. And pretty good resolution of imagery, I'm fairly impressed. From there, we just kind of keep on going through these pictures. And you can kind of get the idea here. Again, this is a picture I took, and it gives you an idea of the lack of snow conditions here. But you start kind of working your way up this, this river path here. And it's a very beautiful canyon. If you've never been back in here, you can go and just advance it yourself if you want to. And then we'll just keep on quickly going through this without belaboring the point. Uh, you can see that this is where we camped at the pass. In fact, I knew we were right here based upon the log. This is where I cooked all my meals. And this was our camp that we set up and again, orient the user. And you'll notice that you really can't see the mountains that we climbed. They're behind all this stuff over here. So we'll kind of continue on. Here's the best camp in Wemanuchi Pass. I took a picture of this. And it's pretty interesting. Google Earth on the web, this is the things you can do. You can create these projects to kind of share with friends or family. And now of course is our climb. You can see Fool's Pyramid, which is one that we summited. And then uh, Rio Grande Pyramid in the back. So I'll just quickly uh, come through and just kind of fast forward these pictures here. And then we'll go into the Google Earth on the desktop and kind of spend some time talking about that. So we went to uh, Opal Lake, and I'll get to those questions afterwards, which are kind of interesting as well. Story maps, oh yeah, story maps is good stuff. And uh, if you are interested in climbing uh, Rio Grande Pyramid, it's uh, practically snow-free. The only snow that we saw was right here on the image. Uh, so we just had to go ahead and circumnavigate this because there was snow right here. But for uh, route planning, for trip planning, this is a really nice way to kind of look at things. In fact, you can kind of see the trail uh, kind of going up the spine of uh, the mountain. And then, you know, just keep on working there. Uh, yep, on summit, I'm just goofing around. And that's where we were right there. So this is uh, what Google Earth on the web is all about, which is kind of interesting. So not as robust as the desktop application. So let's go to the desktop application. So here, this is what they call Google Earth Pro, all right? And so if you wanna go and download this, remember I said it's free, you used to cost money. I'm gonna go and put this in the chat for everyone right now. And if you wanna go and download it a future date, you may. This is the traditional software that you might've seen before. To me, it's, uh, it's interesting. This is how I got really curious about imagery and terrain and things like that. 
me kind of orient you to this. Uh, of course, the main focal point is the planet here. And up at the top is very much a Windows-based application. You can go and open up projects that you create here. You can save them out uh, to places or an image. And notice to say view in Google Maps or view on the web and print or export. So very Windows-based, Windows-centric application here. And then of course, we can do a lot of editing here. Uh, we can look at view sheds. Uh, there's different toolbars to work with. So we can uh, bring in an overview map. This is where we are currently, which is the world. Uh, I'll come to all those questions at the end. We have the legends here. We have atmospheric hazing and then historical imagery. So let's go and kind of do a search here. And I'm gonna go search for, uh, let's go to Golden, Colorado, since that's where CMC is located here. And we'll go and search for that. And the reason I'm doing this is because this particular version of Google Earth is really interesting with historic imagery. So if I come and zoom in, we'll just zoom into the downtown area here. You can see this is downtown Golden, of course, and we have the river, and then I believe CMC is right about over here, uh, right there, I believe. So what I like about this is we can also come in and look at historic imagery. So you can click on this button here, and then the imagery goes back to 99. So we're not gonna see a dramatic change in this, but you can go and take the imagery back to a certain point and see how things changed over time and basically black and white imagery. And in this area of a developed part of downtown Golden hasn't changed a lot, but you can definitely work with what's called historical imagery. We can also come in here and show sunlight across the landscape. So I can come in here and orient the sunlight. So this is what's currently looking right now as the sun's going down, which is kind of interesting. And then as I mentioned before, Google started getting kind of out of this world. They started working with other things. If you click the drop down here, that's, they've got Google Earth, they've also got Google Skies. So if you're backpacking and you wanna figure out the night sky, you can switch it over here and it switches into the sky view. I haven't really spent a lot of time with this myself, but it brings us into our galaxy here. Maybe it's a pinwheel galaxy, uh, it's a different one but you can learn more about the night sky and how this all works. If you're uh, really inspired by SpaceX and what they've done the past couple of days, you can go to Mars if you want to. Uh, it'll switch it over to Mars, there it is. And it does update all of this gallery down here for where the different spacecraft are located. And then of course, uh, the moon is here too. So I'm not gonna belabor skies and moons and Mars because we're gonna talk about hiking and how we can use this for trip planning. So I'll switch it back to Earth here, and let's talk about layers of information. Now, when Google Earth first came out, I loved it. I thought it was pretty interesting, but it's also incredibly busy. It has a lot going on here. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna search for Rio Grande Pyramid on this one here, and we'll come in and type this in really quick, Rio Grande Pyramid, Colorado, and we'll search. And that's gonna take us back to where I was about a week and a half ago here, and we're gonna have our imagery, and that's basically a God's eye view of uh, Rio Grande Pyramid. So I'll come in here, and I'll go and tilt it, and we'll take a look at this, and that looks pretty interesting. Now, let's orient ourselves down to the bottom here. There's a lot going on here. There's a lot of good content. You just have to know where to go. So we have something called the gallery, and what I discovered about the gallery a long time ago was something called Every Trail. Every Trail it was a company that basically tried to map every trail. I don't know if they were successful or not, but they did some good things. So if you click on Every Trail, this will turn on the Every Trail icon. So let's see if there's any around this area. And I'm gonna zoom out a little bit until I get to something that has an icon of Every Trail. So we can see, ah, there's one up here. So there's the icon for Every Trail. It's called Bent Peak, uh, it's a benchmark. And when you click on this, this opens up the Every Trail user interface. So it talks about how to get there, the hiking that you can do, the distance. And then I've tried to go and say, let's go to this and figure it out. But what happens is, if you try to view it on Every Trail, it basically throws an error message. And the reason is all trails bought them out. All trails requires a membership. So things with Every Trail have changed. 
but you can use all trails and work with the membership and how that all works for researching trails. So a little bit of buyer beware in this case uh, with that particular icon, nice way to kind of explore things. Let's go ahead and zoom back into Rio Grande Pyramid and we'll go this way. Now we also have something called Trimble Outdoor Trips. And so this is also available down here. And you can go and turn that layer on and look at the different outdoor trips that are available. And I encourage everyone to explore these. There's National Geographic, there's historical maps from Rumsey and so on here. And that's pretty interesting in how this all works. Um, there's also some other things too. Let me turn these layers off here for the gallery and every trail. But you can come into the gallery again. There's all these different eyes. That basically means the Google Earth community and people just go and create these eyes, which basically mean information. So there's a few here. The Rincon uh, La Vaca Trail talks about where this came from, San Juan Public Land Center. Uh, you can join, click on these links here. So this is all what people have created over 20 years, basically. So pretty interesting stuff with that. So I definitely encourage you to explore how this all works. Now let's talk about trip planning in Google Earth. Um, you might have had a session already about CalTOPO a couple weeks ago. In fact, I'm pretty sure you did. Um, what's interesting about CalTOPO is you can integrate some of the CalTOPO information into Google Earth, which was pretty interesting. So what I'm gonna do is using CalTOPO, I'm gonna go and do a search on Rio Grande Pyramid here for Colorado. And in fact, I'm gonna go and sign in uh, with my Google account here. And the reason for this is I wanna go and export some information out. So we'll say uh, sign in with Google. And so we'll sign me in really quick here. So we'll just do a different account. Bear with me while I do this really quick. Here's my email address for non-work, just outhiking at juno.com. And then I'll just go ahead and put this in here real quick, hide it from y'all. And let's go back to CalTOPO. Now, on the presentation for CalTOPO, what I really like about this is slope stuff. So we have what's called slope angle shading. So this time of the year is a little scary with snow just because of wet slides and things like that. And what we can do is incorporate the CalTOPO uh, slope angle information into Google Earth. It's pretty interesting. So I'm gonna go maybe change the base map a little bit. I'm gonna change it to, uh, let's do uh, Forest Service 2016 as my base map. All right, that looks good, okay. And what I'm gonna do now is go and export this out. So I've got the slope on, and in order to do this, you can basically print it out as what's called a KMZ. All right, that sounds like Google Earth. So I'm gonna say, download the KMZ of this area, and you have to define the area that you want to. So this is what these, this red box is right here. So this is the frame of what's gonna be uh, downloaded. So if I wanna go and move this, I can. So I'll come over here, and I think that's gonna be reasonably good enough. That's just gonna get in my pyramid here in the approach. We'll just call it good right now. And I'll say, download the KMZ. So it's gonna go and give me that information right here. It's downloading currently. And this is gonna go and basically be some data as a KMZ file. It's gonna tell me when it's done. And then what I'm gonna do is some magic. I'm gonna basically go and drag and drop this right into Google Earth here. And now it's done. All right, so let's go say show in the folder. Here it is, all right. Let me go and resize this just a little bit. And let me minimize that page. Now here's Google Earth right here. Here's the magic. What you do is basically drag and drop this onto the Google Earth and notice what it just did. It brought in that KMZ of the slope shading that I was working with here, which is pretty interesting. So if I come over here now, I can go and look at my steep slopes and see what it looks like in Google Earth. All right, so this will refresh a little bit here, but that's, that was something I thought was very fascinating how this all worked. Now, you might be thinking, well, where's the trail, Robert? Where, where are you going? So let me go and bring in the trail here, and we'll go ahead and take a look at that to see if the trail I'm walking on uh, is in those steep slopes. So I'll come in here 
And I'm going to say, let's go in and uh, open a file. And so I'm going to bring in a KMZ file for this. So we'll come over here. And I'm going to say a um, Rio Grande Pyramid. And I'm also going to bring in the 13ers as well. These are KMZ files. All right. And it zooms out a little bit too far, but that's OK. And you can see this red line here. This is the trail that we hiked on. OK, so let's go ahead and orient it around a little bit. And I'll zoom in. And you can see here that the slopes really aren't that bad. We get into this canyon, and the slopes are a little bad there, but it was bone dry when we were there. And then we start going up uh, the Wamanuchi Trail up to the pass. And so the pass is roughly here in this case. And so now you can see the rest of the trail on day two. We follow this old trail, it's called the Lake Opal Trail, hardly ever used anymore. But it does pass some areas that might have potential slope issues. So you can see those here as we're doing the skyline traverse. And then when I come over to do the last 700 feet of Rio Grande Pyramid, well, that trail is pretty good location considering the no other sides of the peak are pretty steep. This seems to be the best way up, and in fact, it was. So this is an integration of Cal Topo slope angles into Gu Earth, which I think is pretty interesting how I can do this. So uh, just something to use for trip planning here uh, with this regard. Now, I did mention that uh, Google Earth is also available as an app. I'm not going to demo that for you, but you can go and download the app as well. And then some other things you can do with Google Earth, of course, is you can go and email this to yourself. You can send it to a printer here. You can also come in, save as a JPEG image or something else. And then uh, view in Google Maps, and you could also save view on the web. Now, there are some silly things here with Google Earth. Like I said, I haven't played with it before, but it does have this flight simulator mode. So if you want to pull out your fighter pilot, you can pilot an F-16 taken off from any airport that you want to around the world. I haven't tried it, but if you want to, you're more than welcome to start a flight and go fly through Google Earth. All right. Now, let me switch gears here and talk briefly about uh, ArcGIS Earth, because I do want to make sure I leave time for questions. So ArcGIS Earth, different application, uh, newer application. In fact, it was released January of 2016, so just, uh, just over four years ago. This is a piece of technology that Esri, the company that I work for, is constantly growing and evolving uh, in what you can do with this. And so you can see here we have what's called a robust help system because this is more designed for, uh, I won't say what's called the GIS professional, but it is designed with our technology in mind. So I'll go ahead and put this uh, chat or this message in the chat for you so you can kind of get some information about how to use this but it tells you how to get started. It's available in Microsoft, Google Play, and the App Store. So if you click on Get Started here, uh, you can see information, some quick references, navigation control. It is free. We don't charge any money for this as well. And then we have different FAQs and forums about how this works. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we also have some free training here as well. So let's get started with ArcGIS Earth. So if you're new to this, uh, this will open up another page here, how to get started. It's a 20 minute uh, tutorial. You can learn more about this. I'll put that in the chat for you. And then lastly, on uh, this PowerPoint, uh, if you want to do visibility analysis, I'll pull this up and copy this into the chat as well. So you got some homework to do there. I'm not going to go and talk about those documents there, but that is available to you. But let's go and talk about deployment options here. There's only two. It's available on the desktop for free, no licensing required, or you can go and put it onto a mobile device. In fact, I'm going to demo the desktop and the mobile devices and show you how this works. So let me go and bring up uh, Google Earth. So let me uh, shut down and free up some bandwidth here of uh, this information. And let's go, and I'm going to do a search on ArcGIS Earth. There we go. This is going to go and start up the application. And when it does, you're going to see something that kind of feels a little bit like Google Earth. So it basically goes through its installation on the splash screen here. 
and then it's going to go and switch over and it does the same rotation that Google Earth does, but it's a cleaner interface. So we have the ability here of working with imagery. These are what we call base maps. And in fact, I'm not even logged in right now, but I will. So if you're not, if you don't have an Esri account, you don't have to have one. You can work with this without an account, but we can change our base maps. And there's something called a base map gallery, which is right here at the top. And when I click on this, it should go in and give me the base maps here. It's been a little pokey for some reason. I think it's a bandwidth issue again. There we go. So I can work with topographic maps here. I can work with open street map. I am currently using imagery with labels. And I can also work with uh, National Geographic base map or what's called the US national map as well. So let's work with uh, the USA topographic maps. There we go. Let's do a search again on Rio Grande Pyramid. I'll go ahead and type that in the top, Rio Grande Pyramid. There it is, I found it. And let's go and take a zoom in, <clears throat> see what it looks like here. So the screen's gonna go and do very much what it did before, like in Google Earth as well. And I'll zoom out a little bit here so we can get some uh, perspective of where we are. But there's those 1 to 24,000 topographic maps that we're all comfortable using. And the interaction is very similar. I can move up or down or around. I can also come in and do a tilt. And so you can do the 3D. You can go and see the topographic map here with the trails going up to the window, a very famous geologic point here. The interface is a lot more simple. Uh, in this case, you can search for anywhere in the world. You can orient back to north here. If I click on home, this takes me back out to our planet Earth here. And then we have what's called 3D effects. So I can come over here, turn on the atmosphere. I can do elevation exaggeration to make those mountains look bigger than they are. Uh, I can also come in here and add data. So if I click on the add data button, uh, this is definitely getting into my world of Esri world, but you have something called ArcGIS Online. What that basically means is cloud-based information. We've got over 4,000 different sources for the world. Someone was asking about Sentinel-2. Yes, there it is. There's Sentinel-2 that I can use in ArcGIS Earth. So let's say that I want to go and search for Wemenuchi. Is that in here? Let's find out. So I'll just do a search for Wemenuchi, and in fact, yes, there is. There's the Wemenuchi Wilderness Area. Uh, it's been used 39 times, but I want to go and add this information, and you just basically click on Merge. And so what happens is it brings in the Wemenuchi information here, and we can still search for other things as well. You know, there's all this different talking about birding and more. And so here I've got basically all these different uh, polygons, these are areas. And so if I expand this out, we can see that I've got trails in here, I've got boreal toad habitat, and the wilderness boundary. So if I go and turn off the wilderness boundary, what we're seeing right now with these lines, those are the trails. Those are the trails that are in this area. And in fact, if you click on this, it brings up information. This is the Skyline Highline Opal Lake Trail. It's dirt, it's a trail managed by the Forest Service and so on. So you get all this kind of descriptive information, which is pretty nice. Now I can also come in and search for more data. So I could say, you know what, let's go look for Colorado mountains. So I'll type in Colorado mountains. Let's see what pops up here. I've got 14ers, that's interesting. I've got mountain parks. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of different surveys, Rocky Mountain National Park, and then a whole bunch of information. It's kind of endless in a way. So you can see all the different information here that's available to us as well. So open space mountain park trails and so on. So this is all different things that are available for Colorado. I can certainly go in and add. And if I want to, I can also add files from my disk. And so if I say add files, I can click on select files and I can bring in a KML or KMZ. Let's bring in the 13ers, KMZ. All right, there it is. There's all these points. There's one right here, if I click on it, that one is point 13278, otherwise known as Fool's Pyramid. Here's another one right here, which we happen to know it is Rio Grande Pyramid, there it is. So these are all waypoints that someone collected on a GPS. So I can integrate 
in these different points, these KML, KMZ files into Google Earth. And so you have the ability of doing a few things. We can go and move them to the bottom. We can look at its properties. You can remove it from the map as well. Now I'm looking at my time. Let's go ahead and talk about a few more things and then I'll open it up to questions. You can also come in here and sketch in things. I can draw in a line. So let's go and zoom in. And let's say I wanna go draw something. So I'm gonna go and navigate and swing this around a little bit. And I happen to know that I approached this mountain a particular way. So I can grab my pencil. I'm gonna draw a line. I'm gonna come, come down here. We can say it's an untitled line. We're gonna say uh, trail to summit. Uh, we'll give it a nice blue color. And we can go and change the colors as we want to instead of transparency. And now I'm gonna come in and basically say, well, this is what I did. I know I basically followed this drainage here, and I basically came up this spine all the way to the summit, and then I'll just double click there, and it'll go ahead and bring that trail to summit in here, at least it should here momentarily. And for some reason it's not showing, it's weird. Oh, there it is, I just need to zoom out. So there's my uh, file there. And so I now have this as a drawing file. I can do a right click here and look at its elevation profile from the old trail to the summit. So let's go take a look at the elevation profile. So from where the trail, uh, where I went off the trail and to the summit here, you can see here that I was at 12,316 when I left the trail. And then you can kind of see as I'm going up the mountain, the angle of slope, 24%, 70%, which probably wasn't right, but uh, you can kind of see that it's moving up here and you get this elevation profile all the way up to the summit, which was approximately 13,800 some change. So elevation profiles are pretty interesting in this case. I can also come in and do what's called interactive analysis. We can do what's called uh, a line of sight. We can do a view shed. For folks not familiar with the view shed, this is what, you, what can you see from the top or what you, can you see from down below. So I can come over here, let's change our view shed to red to green, and I'll just go ahead and put this down here, and you can kind of see this is what I can see here. Standing at that point where it's red, I can't see it, where it's green, I can see. So you can go and change these parameters here by the tilt, the angles, both vert and horizontal, which is pretty interesting. I can also come in here and do what's called a line of sight. So if I'm standing down here at the trail, I'm gonna go ahead and place a point, and can I see it up here? So I'll come over, and if it turns red, I can't see it. Actually, let's change the color. If it turns green, I can see it. If it's red, I can't. So here, all the way to here, I can see it. And then on the summit, I can pretty much see it standing there. If I'm looking over at Fool's Pyramid, I can see the top of Fool's Pyramid. Can I see this far one? No, it's turning red, so this mountain is blocking it. So you can kind of see with this interactive line of sight, what can I see from here, which is pretty powerful. Last thing I wanna show you is the mobile application. And then I'll turn it over for some questions and answering here. So let me go and minimize this. And what's gonna happen here, I've got to log into uh, the Zoom meeting on my iPhone. So give me just a moment to do that. And I'll do that right now. We'll start the broadcast. And it's starting it right now. Oh, connection failed. Okay, so let's try this really quick. I'm gonna shut down Zoom and let's restart Zoom. And I think what happened, Mike, is I left it on and so it didn't really like my meeting being open. So I'm gonna log out of the meeting, log back in, and then we should be good to go here. So I'm entering, good. In, entering credentials now. And let's do a join the meeting. And let me put in my secret super password here that everyone has in this room, which is kind of interesting. And okay, successful there, I'm logging in, it's connecting. And I'm gonna go and share my screen. Oh, I know what happened, I gotta stop sharing. Okay, let's try this one more time. And I'll share my screen now. Okay, and there we go, it works, all right. It works. So now you're looking at my iPhone and I've downloaded ArcGIS Earth here. So in fact, I'm gonna go and start this. 
and it's going to go and start up. There's a little bit of latency going through a wireless connection through Zoom and so on, but this is ArcGIS Earth on my iPhone. You can see that we have the same buttons on the top right. I can go and work with data here and add some data. I can go search for something. So let's go search for Rio Grande Pyramid. And it's going to come in and zoom into Rio Grande Pyramid here. And then do a little 3D. I can kind of do the pinch movement to zoom in. I can pan a little bit. And then I can also do tilt in the app as well. And so I can go and look around here see how this works. I can also go back to the home, which we saw before, but we'll come back in and do a search on Rio Grande. Let's go back here again. Oh, that's Denver. That'll be good enough. So now we can see Denver here and all the information here. And then at the very bottom, we also have this, uh, once I get out of the search mode here, we have this toolbox at the bottom. So at the very bottom, I can come in here and add files from the cloud. I can add files locally, those KML, KMZs, or something from a QR code. I can also come in here and uh, identify where I'm at for place marks. So I can go and digitize in a point, for example. I could say, let's go to uh, Civic Center Park, and I'll just place a point here. And there it is. You can go and name these. And for the sake of brevity, I won't. So you can go and add points and lines and polygons inside of this. I can also do what's called measure. And so I can measure a point, measure a line. And then I can also come over here and create a tour from the album. And these are kind of interesting. So if you have pictures, you can create what's called a tour. So let me do that really quick and show you what a tour looks like. I'm gonna show you some pictures of what we did uh, this past weekend. So I'll just do one, two, uh, three, four, and then we'll bring in the troll and we'll say done. So it's going to go and create a tour for me and I'll go ahead and save it. Actually, actually let's, let's play it. So it starts off of where this digital picture was taken, uh, which is going to be right there. So that's where we were on the trail. And then it goes to the next picture, which is what snow conditions looked right there. And then the next trail picture here. And then the last picture is uh, old gold mine right there. And the last one is the troll in Breckenridge, which is going to be here. So you can create these tours uh, using ArcGIS Earth uh, on your mobile device and share that with friends and family as well. So I know this is a lot of information coming at folks really quick. And uh, it might be some new information that you haven't uh, seen or heard before, but I do want to open it up to uh, questions as well. And I'll go ahead and put this on the uh, chat here. Let me bring up, I know I had, whoops. Uh, let's see here, where's my Zoom meeting? I have to share my screen again. Apologies for that, so let me do that really quick. And I think everyone should see this now. And let me bring up my chat window. And I know there's a couple questions. So Mark Evans asked the question, is there a way to get current images like Sentinel-2? And in fact, in RTS Earth, yes, there was. Robbie's asking the question, is there a Mac version uh, for this? Um, with uh, Google Earth, the download on your desktop, I suspect not because this was based on a Windows application back in the day. But if you work with Google Earth on uh, your mobile device, then yes. Uh, there's one for the iPhone and the Android. Uh, David Licky asked a question, how often is the imagery updated? Well, I can speak for Esri. We like to update about every quarter, if possible, for first world countries. Uh, for second and third world, it's a little bit uh, less frequent because there's just not a lot of data out there. So we do work a lot with uh, satellite providers to update the imagery base maps for Esri. So uh, we do work with that quite a bit. Uh, Lou Henfield asked the question, how does pre uh, present compare with story maps? And so you're talking about the Google Earth uh, presentation versus the story maps application. So for folks not familiar with story maps, uh, this is something that's also from Esri. It's one of our most successful storytelling app uh, called storymaps.arcgis.com. I'm really partial to this because I think it's fantastic. And so there's the URL if you're curious. Uh, story maps allow you to combine web maps, uh, pictures, 
text and so on, the best way to kind of uh, vision a story map is to look at one. So let me go to the overview here and I'm gonna show you uh, a story map. So I'm gonna go to explore stories and I would argue that it's more, there's more capability in a story map than say uh, Google Earth presentation. So let's pick a fun one here. Let's go to uh, topic, uh, we'll go to nature and environments. And when I go to this category, let me show you one of these story maps here. So we'll look at the, uh, let's do the world according to satellites, why not? So this opens up a story map here, the world according to story maps, and it basically starts with a title and a subtitle. And then effectively you just scroll down. And so it talks about history and weather. And as we start going through this, it's basically telling a story. You're gonna see different types of multimedia here, in this case, uh, newspaper clipping. And then we come down, uh, they talk about uh, people of Galveston had no warning and you know, talks about all these different pictures and so on. So uh, explore the story maps one here. It's pretty interesting, uh, but I would say it's more capability than Google Project. Uh, Nick asked the question, how often are Sentinel-2 maps updated? Could they be used to see current snowpack levels? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't have the answer for that. So if you do like Esri, uh, Sentinel-2, let's see what pops up here. We have, uh, Mark says every five days, there you go. So we have what's called the Sentinel Explorer. Who knew? I didn't know about this one. Um, so you can click on that uh, and work with the Sentinel Explorer. And this pulls up here. And I have, this is just live demo. I've never used this before, so I don't know what this is about. Uh, but there's a Sentinel Explorer there. Great for snow, yep. So uh, definitely do a search on Sentinel-2 and Esri, but it looks like every five days. Uh, here's something, this will be a good article for you. Sentinel-2 more than meets the eye. I'll put this in the chat for folks with uh, Sentinel questions. You can see what Esri's doing with this, but it's available in something called the Living Atlas. So I suspect it's updated on a regular basis. Great for snow, I would agree. All right, I'm gonna go up here. Uh, resistance is futile, thank you. They got the reference, awesome. That's all the questions I see. Are there more questions you might have about Google Earth, the web, uh, the desktop, the uh, app, or ArcGIS Earth? All right, well, I'll put my information up here. Uh, there you go. So if you have any questions about anything, um, feel free to uh, send me an email. I know. In in fact, a lot of folks in my last presentation did, so I appreciate that. Uh, question from David, do either apps download GPX files? Uh, that's a great question, and that's a really good thing because with GPX, you're right, um, that one's interesting. If I come over here and add the data, I think natively in this case, without some data massaging, uh, not on ArcGIS Earth, but I know our other applications do uh, that are uh, more, uh, they require uh, money, I guess. Uh, in this case here with uh, the web, let's take a look at this one. Actually, we'll go back to Google Earth here. There we go, let me bring up Google Earth Pro. And on this one, if I say file open, let's look at the formats it can open. It can bring in, wow, a lot of stuff. So I'm looking at this, I'm not seeing a GPX on this one. So I would say, oh, there's GPS right here. I, I apologize, yes. Google Earth Pro can do a GPX, so yes. Uh, ArcGIS Earth natively right now, no, without some data massaging. All right, other questions? All right, well, I've got one after the hour, one after 8 p.m. Uh, Mike, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Thanks, Robert. Uh, great stuff. Um, I obviously, I like everybody else, I was familiar with Google Earth to some degree, um, but uh, the ESRI one, the ArcGIS is 
really more or less new to me and there's some great features in there that I'm going to check out after this webinar and also the Sentinel-2 stuff seems very, very interesting. So uh, thank you so much for doing this again. <laughs> this, was really, this was really great and this time we actually recorded it. So, yeah. so we're good to go for, for future uh, requests here. Um, thanks everybody for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, don't forget next week we're going to talk about public lands um, history as well as what are the restrictions. So uh, a, a nice little uh, info session that you might want to um, attend uh, as in, and especially since it's probably useful for trip planning. So um, with that, I'll say have a good night, folks, and see you next week, hopefully. Thanks. Thanks, Robert. This was great. Hi, you're welcome.